This is not another clickbait title, I promise you. This is the real deal, okay? This car was waiting in the dusty corner of a forgotten barn for just the right person to come along and bring it back to grid. I guess that's me. I, yeah, I, I guess so. Who are you? I'm Ryan. It, R right, Ryan. That's Ryan. And uh, this... This is a 1973 MGB GT. We affectionately call the MGB GTS. And you're watching Outside, Inside, Outside Racing. W yeah, what, you know what he said. I've always loved MGBs. My dad had a 77 MGB when I was a kid, and I kind of grew up going to the British car shows and whatnot. And I had decided long ago that one of these would be in my future because the GTs are just so much cooler than, yes. the, than the, the... I mean, a convertible's cool. You can let your hair blow and whatnot. But, you know, the, the GT just has a much better look to it. Um, but they race these, right? Like, um, pretty extensively race the GTs. Any track in England throughout the 60s and 70s, any autocross, they um, called them Gymkhana's then, mm -hmm. uh, was full of MGBs. Great enthusiast car. It was the Miata of the time. Right, yeah. The GTs, they did the 24 Hours of Le Mans a couple times. Mm. Um, mixed results, but, you know... Yeah. Um, they did compete, and over the years, they've become even more successful. Yeah, well, as time goes on, progresses happen in, in you know modern cars and how you can tune them and whatnot, and you apply that to the older cars, just like we're doing all the time at OIO Racing. And these still have an, a huge enthusiast following. You can get about anything you want from these cars from Moss Motors. Is that in town, in, here in Kansas City? Or, because they, I know there used to be Victoria British, but... Right. So Moss bought out Victoria British, who was in town here, and mm -hmm. so they converted all over to LMC Truck. Mm. Um, another great supplier. If you've got an old truck, literally you can get any parts yeah. from LMC Truck. From LMC Truck. Not a sponsor. Not yes. a sponsor. <laughs> But yeah. Moss took them over, and they're still doing a great job. They're putting out the big catalog that has all the part numbers mm -hmm. and um, you know assembly guides and that sort of thing. It makes the MGB a real enthusiast car. This car, prior to your ownership, was raced here in Kansas City by someone else too, right? Yeah, uh, Kevin Brown owned it, and uh, Kevin Brown has raced a bunch of cool cars over the years. He's got a couple other MGBs, and he wanted to keep this one for the drivetrain. But he did autocross it and rally cross it both. I don't know how well he did. I know Kevin's a good driver. Very good. He probably, yeah. he probably did really well in this car as good as you can. As good as you can in, a, in an old MGB. And it mm -hmm. had all the original components when I got the car, except mm -hmm. for it had been lowered. And the first couple of events it did lowered, I could feel the seat pan scraping, uh, which is where exactly where I sit, about an inch above it. So yeah. not wanting to be ripped out of the bottom of the car. Right, yeah. I had to fix that. Yeah, so the rescue. I mean, we didn't really rescue it, honestly. Like, Kevin had the car and he kept it, you know, nice and dry because Kevin keeps the car nice. He was never going to let this car go completely back to the earth and whatnot because he couldn't stand to see it. Um, but it still, you know, had to be pulled out of a, of a field and, you know, came out of the barn and then out of the field. It had been sitting in a metal tin shed. It looked just like uh, the opening from uh, what was the Forza. Oh, yeah, right. The, yeah, yeah. When you find the, the lost car in Forza and the doors open up, it looked just like that. Yeah, right. Yeah. Half the tires were flat, yeah. um, covered in mud dauber's nests. I had told Kevin that, you know... I'm not a small guy. These are incredibly small cars. Yeah. I brought my helmet with me. I said, if I can fit in the car with the seat you got in it and put my helmet on, it's sold. I'll yeah, take right, it. Yeah, right, right. And I sat in it with my helmet on, and I was sold. We interrupt your regularly scheduled program to bring you this very important message. Facebook.com slash Charlie's Kidney. That's Facebook, Charlie's Kidney. And you can find out about this sticker and the big stickers that are on Dale, and the magnets that are on the MGB in the video that you're watching right now. They're all for our buddy Charlie Bigsby. We're trying to raise awareness that he needs a kidney. He's got two that are junk, just like the motor in the MGB before Ryan transplanted it eh, with the Toyota 4AC, giving it a new lease on life, and that's what we want to do for Charlie with his kidneys. So you probably have two good kidneys, and uh, he could just use one of them. 
You only need one of them, maybe. Probably you only need one of them. So if you could, please take the time to go to facebook.com slash Charlie's Kidney. Uh, that's facebook.com slash Charlie's Kidney. I'll say it one more time. It's facebook.com slash Charlie's Kidney. Check out the story. There's a lot of videos posted there and whatnot about uh, Charlie and his Toyota-loving past. He has so many cool cars. He's such a great guy. He's helped us out so much over the years. And we just want to help him out by trying to find somebody that can donate him a kidney. Um, we, we are not the ones, apparently. We've tried. It, maybe you are. Maybe it's you. Could be. Do not know. But if you could, please um, check out the Facebook page and, you know, share your spare. The tires were face uh, um, 1985 AE86. Fantastic car. Lots of excellent parts on it from Techno Toy Tuning mm -hmm. that made it uh, just perfect. It was perfect. You tap the brakes and you could dance around a cone. It was too easy to drive. I <laughs> felt that I wasn't being challenged enough and that, uh, hate to say it this way, but winning was easy. Yeah, local and, for sure. Winning, winning came very easy and has come very easy for you for like what six seasons. Yeah. So I wanted to drive something more antiquated, more uh, terrible, mm -hmm. maybe, <laughs> um, but had some good points. I, like, think you, I think you missed the mark because it's not terrible at all. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is what I liked about it versus that. You sit about I don't know, almost a foot lower in the car. Um, the you're kind of the whole chassis is set above you in the MGB. You're like the lowest part of the car. Also, where you your position in the car is that you're so much further back. Literally, you're sitting almost on top of the rear axle. The closer you are to the rear axle on a rear wheel drive car, the more you can feel feel the rear end move, and the more you can feel the rear end move, the better you can place the car on the track. So lower, further back. Got me interested in this car right off the bat. The double A arms in the front, even though they're super old and weird, better than what was on the 8.6. And I thought, what would it be like to have had an 8.6 in 1973? This yeah. would be it. Yep. The things I've noticed, the difference between the two, the actual stiffness of the chassis of these, these are very floppy. Mm -hmm. The 8.6 was a really good chassis right off the showroom floor. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, they're all rusty nowadays, but I had done everything to increase the stiffness of that chassis. Mm -hmm. And with this, I've done none of that to. Maybe on the agenda next to stiffen up the chassis, maybe add some bars here and there to, to get some of that stiffness back. You could really tell it after I jumped it at Hoop DX. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, it felt a little bit more floppy after that. Um, that's all things that can be fixed. I have not found a problem with this car so far that can't be engineered around. Right on. And speaking of the engineering, we need to talk about what has gone into putting a Toyota Heart in this British car because it, it has been some engineering and then some yes. hammering and whatnot too, but you know, definitely some engineering. The hammering is the fun part. <laughs> There it is. Look it's, at it. It's there. This is it. Uh -huh. It's um, from its winter slumber. You can see, uh, yes, uh, thanks, uh, Clarissa mm. and Eric, for this filter but, that I need to give back to you. Um, I borrowed it like years ago, so <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Hot Hatch Racing, shout out. It's just a 1985 Toyota 4AC engine. It's an eight-valve single overhead cam that's carbureted. I just, you know, set it down in this MGB. That, yeah, that's all it took. We've got some old video of when you actually, you know, were trying to cram it in there. And it definitely took some massaging of one part or the other to, to get it to fit. But not too much. Like, not as much as some other things might have. No, really, the main things I had to do, the front subframe, um, because this engine is a front sump engine, as in the mm -hmm. oil pans on the front of the engine, yep. it interfered with the subframe. Because the... This is subframe is set up for a rear sump engine. Now, I know they make 4AG rear sump conversions and all that, but okay. I wasn't going to spend all that money. This right. was so I could make an MGB as factory Toyota as possible, mm -hmm. which meant using a factory oil pan, oil pickup and all that. Yeah. So instead, I cut the cross member out mm -hmm. and then replated it back with thicker than stock metal. So it's actually stronger than it was before. Yep. And I've got lots of clearance around the front of the motor now. Then the distributor, which sticks out the side here, uh, interfered with that corner right there. Mm -hmm. And uh, a hammer fixed that. Yeah. 
Besides that, it's carbureted, so basically I use the stock electrical uh, connections here yeah. and uh, a distributor plate to distribute the power. A hose kit that I modified from an 8.6 to use the factory aluminum radiator for this. The, my coolant fan here is actually off of a CRV. I tried some trick aftermarket fans, <laughs> but this factory CRV part pushes just as good, if not right. better. Electric fan controller from Faucet uh, works really good. It turns on thermostatically, so it's like there's no switches. I, I have one switch for the gauges, one switch to make the rest of it go, and that's yes. it. Right on. I made it as simplistic as possible. Yeah. It uses the factory throttle cable here that I just connected up to my progressive carburetor. Uh-huh. And which, obviously, I need to clean that air filter. A little dirty. A little dirty. Seen a few events. Uh-huh. I haven't got it ready this year so far. It was literally pulled out of a snowbank about, uh, I don't know, 30 minutes ago. Right, yeah. So. Well, and this with this motor, it saw plenty of action in the 8.6 over the years, and it's been gone through and rebuilt it looks factory from the outside but on the inside it's probably anything but but it's it's also a toyota motor so it just does what it's supposed to do even if the air filter is dirty all right yeah the the engine is um it's a stock 4ac bottom end i milled the head i think two millimeters and used a 0.5 thickness head gasket which is the thinnest you can get uh -huh. so compression ratio should be around 10 and a half to 11 i run 93 octane pump fuel I ported the head, the intake, the exhaust manifold, uh, the carburetor adapter, ported all of it, then basically remade the exhaust manifold to not have any of the weird switchover heat valve things they use for the carburetor mm. to, that just puts heat in the carburetor. And other than that, it's stock. So mm -hmm. basically just bolt-on modifications, I would guess it makes 100 horsepower. Yeah. T50 trans? Or, yes, a Toyota yeah. T50 transmission which I just used a, so this is a six bolt flywheel. So I used a lightened flywheel that actually comes in a front wheel drive Toyota, mm -hmm. which uses a 212 millimeter clutch. Yep. The engine was rated for like 120 horsepower and I figured this will never make it. So stock, a uh, factory socks clutch, yeah. you know, a uh, lightweight flywheel factory clutch. Okay. Makes it yeah. easy to drive. I was able to use the factory clutch uh, master cylinder and I just made a line to connect to the Toyota one. Right on. So it's uh, it's all kind of just made with adapters. So the yeah. chassis is all factory MGB mm -hmm. and the drivetrain's all factory Toyota. Right so on. if they still sold these parts on the shelf, I could go to the parts store and buy them. Yeah, right. But they do not. No. Yeah. yeah. It's akin to having the old Toyotas, right? Like, yep. same thing, right? You're still dealing with the fact that nobody really makes... There's not a lot of aftermarket either, but nobody definitely is making, you know, OEM style parts anymore. The manufacturers don't make them. They're not on the shelves anywhere. So it's a, uh, it, why not? You know, besides Moss Motors. Moss Motors, of course. Yeah. Uh, the rear end in this one is stock, but not. Right. Okay. So the rear end in this is a stock rear end that would have came in this car. It's uh, what they call a banjo rear end um, okay. but it's a mgb rear end and uh, i've welded the the spider gears so it's a welded differential mm -hmm. uh, they work really good on the dirt because the dirt acts like the lsd uh -huh. right. so not recommended for street driving yeah. this car has actually made enough torque to break two axles in this current configuration <laughs> as well which is crazy because uh it should only make 100 horsepower but um, this is on the life of this motor is actually the third axle. It's right. broke. Yeah. I was there and for the breaking of the, of that first axle on the eight, six. It just twists them. It's a monster. All right. So suspension wise. So I haven't done a huge amount to the front of this car yet, but we'll get to that. Mm -hmm. Um, on the rear, I didn't like how much suspension travel it had on a, uh, MGB. You've got a plate that goes underneath the um, drive shaft area for added stiffness in the chassis, which is great, mm. but it was limiting my down travel of my suspension. And I wanted to be a little bit higher here in the back. So I got new GT Roadster Springs from Moss, put those on, and um, I still wasn't happy with the shocks on it, which I was running the original lever shocks on these. And through the high speed oscillations we get in Rallycross, because we're going, you know, 40, 50 miles an hour through very rough terrain, mm -hmm. the suspension's got to react really quickly. Yeah. And I could actually feel that the rear shocks were starting to foam because they were moving so quick because oh, they wow. use oil in them. Yeah, right. So it'd be great at first, mm -hmm. and then it'd get progressively worse the faster you went. I see. 
So I needed to upgrade to a modern telescopic shock. They make conversions for this, bolt-on conversions. The main problem is their suspension. It's good for autocross. It's good for road racing. It's not good for rally because you only have three or four inches of suspension travel. Right. I wanted six to eight. Mm -hmm. So I just figured out that if uh, I cut a hole in the floor where the shocks used to be and welded in a bar across the top here, I could just run a stock telescopic shock. And so to make my plan work, I just bought some random ones off of Facebook Marketplace for $20. As you do. So these are brand new Jeep Wrangler front shocks Nice. Um, that I put on the rear of my MGB, but uh -huh. they fit the length perfectly. They fit the eye holes perfectly. Yeah. Everything I measured, this is a completely bolt-on kit. As long as you cut a hole in the floor and weld a piece of metal in the back. <laughs> totally bolt-on. Completely bolt-on. And uh, the rate on those Jeep shocks for the front of a Jeep must be pretty stiff compared to what was back here before, right? Right. And knowing some old uh, motocross guys, they run on the rear of their bikes a kind of a, a soft spring and a very stiff, stiff shock. shock. Yeah. So I was thinking I'd give that a try on a car. A hmm. soft spring made for nice road comfort in a GT, four people in the car, mm -hmm. never happen. And a stiff as balls shock. Right. I think I, I messed that up a time or two thinking that I needed a stiffer spring in the rear because I wanted the car to rotate more, right? But... Uh, it doesn't make, it just bounces. <laughs> right. <laughs> you just end up bouncing around. Well, so. and it's all, it's all trial and error. I can yeah. math my way completely through the whole thing and get it wrong. Right. Yeah, for sure. hundred <laughs> percent. The other thing you'll see here is I've got this harness bar here, which I made from just leftover junk and actually eccentric, um, adjusting bolts off of a Volkswagen. Hmm, nice. Because I needed a good place to put my harness. But what about the front suspension? I think I have a front over on my shelf of shame. You know things are getting exciting when we're putting on the gloves Brian here. putting on the rubber glove. I'm just going to take a step back. <laughs> this is a, actually what a front shock Bring it over here a little bit. off of an MGB looks like. It's uh, made by Armstrong. They call them lever shocks. And this one here is not completely blown up. But you can see this area here is all free movement. And that's what happens to these shocks. You actually add fluid into them through there. And they start to leak out, which is why this is covered in grease. What's the orientation in the car? Okay, so this would be the upper control arm. Oh, okay. So you have a lower control arm here yep. and a spring uh -huh. here. And this is your upper control arm and shock all in one. I'll be damned. So it's a really compact design. Yeah. It makes it difficult to put something aftermarket on oh, there. Oh, for sure, yeah. Unless you build it all, which right. is something I'm working on. But I've kept up with the factory ones and I've uh, taken them apart. You can take them apart through the back of here. Mm -hmm. And there's actually a valve right here that you can adjust the spring pressure on to make oh, them stiffer. That's awesome. And I've done all that in the front end of the car and I can still start to feel the oscillation, mm -hmm. but that's a project we're working on next. So there's just pistons in there pushing fluid and mm -hmm. yeah, okay, got it. Yeah, there's two huh. pistons in there going either direction. And yeah. as this lever up or down works right. as has a crankshaft. So <laughs> this one here, yeah. The lever is actually pointed, the piston's all the way out here, and as you lift it, that piston comes down, and then it moves fluid to the blower piston. That's crazy. I mean, I know they used this design for years and years and years, but, like, uh, how does this compare to, like, a, you know, McPherson or, a, you know, like, an actual double-A arm, you know, like, set up, like, reliability-wise, I guess? Uh, these work really well as long as you keep them full of fluid. Okay. And you have nice, stiff uh, valves in them. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, is they all leak because mm -hmm. they're all sure. old and <laughs> yeah, right. you can't get new parts for right, them. Yeah. And if I could get them to be completely sealed units, uh -huh. I'd keep up with them, which I've been sourcing some really good used ones and been rebuilding them and had good luck with them so far. Mm. Just this one was, it kept leaking and you can see the free play there. Too floppy. Yeah. So this one got replaced with another used one. But the front is... Other than uh, Hawk brake pads... Yeah. Uh, completely stock. Okay. And Hawk sold pads for this car for an MG? Uh, yeah. I actually, the first year I went to Nationals, I got fifth place, which was good enough for a set of Hawk brake pads. Yeah, yeah. So my winnings from Nationals the first year got the Hawk brake pads on the front. And the brakes on an MGB are 
about the size of a postage stamp. Yeah. So like even a, when you put Hawk brake pads on there, it just makes them marginal, which yeah. is perfect for rally. Marginal cross. is great. That's all we need. <laughs> so um, looking on the inside here, uh, it looks like an MGB, but with some switches and stuff in there and uh, a very uncomfortable seat. <laughs> That's what it looks like to me. Man. Yeah. The, the seat that I used in here was... Uh, a Kirky seat that I got on Facebook Marketplace for 50 bucks. Mm -hmm. um, but I love them. Yeah. They're terrible, but I love them because yeah, right, um, right. they're cheap and they sit incredibly low. Real low. Really, really low. And um, that's what I wanted. I wanted to be basically bolted to the floor, and that's what you have in this car. <laughs> so you could feel absolutely everything. Feel every rock hit you in the ass. Through your spine. <laughs> yeah, right. And um, I've achieved that. That worked out good. But I needed some cushion on it, so I had... Uh, my mother uh, do a little bit of uh, upholstery on it. Now, mm. she is not an upholsterer. She makes uh, lots of cool stuff, but she doesn't make seat covers. Could have fooled me. I mean, that looks <laughs> looks pro to me. Uh, looks like we're going on a picnic. That's it for the seats. Uh, seat belts were a holdover from the uh, 8.6, which are just your standard. Mm -hmm. um, three inch. Yeah, standard three inch. Um, clip together. Racing harness holds you in there nice and tight. Racing uh, harness is not required for rallycross, but um, a good idea in a car that you're going to get bounced to death in. Right? Yes. Yeah. Which is also why it has the fire extinguisher in there. That's mm -hmm. a thing you need for hoopty cross. Mm -hmm. And uh, ever since I put it in there for that, I thought, you know, why hasn't all of my cars had this? Yeah. Uh, I've said this a lot of times on the channel, but we don't. It's rally cross is really safe. We've, we've seen cars roll, but they roll at very slow speeds and people just, we just push them back over and people get out of them and then we roll the car away. So there's not, even when they're a higher speed for a rally cross, it's not super dangerous, but, um, the, every bit of safety gear that you can have is not going to uh, negatively affect you in the long run. That extra five pounds or whatever for the fire extinguisher is well worth it to keep you from burning to death. Correct. The, um, Gauges on the dash are largely non-functional. Um, <laughs> I have a water temperature gauge in there. I have a tachometer and I have an air fuel ratio gauge, all of which are from various other projects that I had sitting on the shelf. This was all just a, I've got a huge pile of parts. I should build a car type project. Yeah. And all these things came from that. Um, the steering wheel, uh, which of course we did it at detachable steering wheel. I actually got the steering wheel from Ian. Is that, that's mine. I forgot about that. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it was a little nicked up and whatnot, but man, it looks good. It looks great. And, it's, and it, when he said he needed one for this car, I was like, I got the wheel. Yep. <laughs> I know what it is. Yep. And so I was just used a, an adapter on that, which I put to a strange uh, quick release that we had sitting on the shelf here in the back of the shop for, I don't know, 30 years because it fit nothing. So I made it fit this mm -hmm. with welding and cutting and drilling. And everything else is all functional switch panel there, right? I did, some, did some of them not work? First one's for gauges, second one's for everything else, fuel pump, all that, uh -huh. um, which actually powers that fuse box down there, yep. which I don't have a huge amount on that fuse box right now because the two other things I wanted to add, the blue is supposed to be for the wipers and the yellow one's supposed to be for the heater fan. And even though I wired them up and tested them, they're both wasted because they're British. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the downfall. If you know British cars, you're here because you know British cars. You know that Lucas Electrics are um, the scourge of all British cars. And if, you, if you're here not knowing that, now you do. If you want to enter, if you think this car looks cool and you want to enter into a classic British car project, realize that ele electronics are going to be your nemesis from, from day one. This starts and runs so well because I just made a wiring harness. Mm -hmm. um, I used none of the, the factory British Lucas wiring harness at all. I just made my own. It's yeah. um, You can get really good wires nowadays. This fuse panel was like 15 bucks and mm -hmm. works awesome. I got the MSD box mounted down there low in the corner, able to run all my electronics, and I still have, what, seven more spots open on it. Whatever you need. You got it, You want to put in a radio, some Bluetooth, yep. you know, and yeah, you can you can get out the jams. Handbrake works, right? Yeah, which is always throws people off. I don't know if you know this, but the MGB ones work opposite of the way they normally do. You lift the handle up, then you press the button in it to make it stick. All you have to do is pull. Just don't touch the button, and it's your built-in drift stick. Oh, okay. Oh, so it only locks when you put. I get it now. I get it now. So it only locks when you push in the button. So it's just wor it's working all the time. That's mm -hmm. great. Yeah, yeah. But it doesn't lock. It doesn't ratchet and lock on you. Nope. That's awesome. 
don't want to walk away from the car without talking about the side pipe. So let's let's talk about that for a minute. Why? Well, this is the third exhaust this car has had on it. Uh-huh. I have made two that have run underneath the car. I made one that went underneath the car. I went and put it on the ground. It was about a half inch above the ground. Mm-hmm. Not acceptable. So I remade it, tucked it back up about another two inches. Well, then it was two and a half inches off the ground. Still not acceptable. Right. Um, I couldn't even load it onto my trailer yeah. because it hung down so low. Right. These cars have zero room underneath them for an exhaust Nothing. system. And the factory system was like an inch and a half around. Yeah. So I did the simplest thing possible because I had to make it in one night, use some bent chunks I had and welded it together and some extra mufflers I had. And I didn't want to like drill holes into the side of the car to mount it. So I actually mounted it on the factory jack point with some polyurethane um, sway bar bushings that I found in the trash. That's so awesome. It actually has not been modified from stock at all. There's no holes drilled. It's not actually even covering any rust. And this is actually the second version of this. Uh, the first version got ripped off the first year at uh, Hoopty Cross. <laughs> and so we basically just had a flame spitting pipe coming out the back. Nice. Out the side, that is. And uh, so now it's welded better or something. I commend you for taking this to Hoopty Cross because, you, I mean, like like you said, it's spine crushing, right? Yes. And, uh, yeah, and doing any kind of jumping with this thing is insane. But it does it. And yeah. It, and then the pipes stay on. It did. Okay. So for wheels and tires, talk about that for a minute. We got the Alpha Racing Tire with a Y. Got a Y on there. Tires. Uh, Euro cross, which everybody is kind of running. Yeah. And, um, that's what I've always run on this car. Uh, I'll run the radials on the back when it's looser in the morning, just like you do on the MR2. MR2. The um, tires, yeah. another reason why I went with the MGB was because the bolt pattern is the same as the eight, six. Mm-hmm. Um, now they call this four by four and a half where the eight, six is four by 114.3, which right. actually equals four and a half. Right. Either way, the offset's about the same. They go straight on the car, and you have a great selection of wheels going with that. It's not an obscure four on 108, like, you know, if I was to be running a, which I would love to, a Mark One or Mark II Escort right. roll drive. I would not. Um, but it's not a weird, crazy offset that you need to immediately like drill new hubs for and find wheels for. You can still find wheels all day long for these. And these 8.6 GTS wheels look fantastic. They do. And, and it brings the Japanese, you know, uh, theme that's on the inside of the car to the outside of the car, too, which is fantastic. Now all you need is big, crazy over fenders, <laughs> you know. So Yes, and someday um, with some maybe – Different stock suspension designs. Um, with the numbers I got, it should add about three inches per side. Um, so it would be overall six inches wider, which would bring it to the proper amount of crazy we need for the outside of this. Mm-hmm. That about wraps up the explanation of the car and all the things that it is now. Right. But what will it become? The rear axle makes me angry. Mm-hmm. I have kept fixing it because I can still find $50 differentials, and it takes me about... Two hours to tear it down and put a new axle in it. So um, I've kept with that, but I'd really love to upgrade to like a nice beefy boy, like an 8.8 or something like Mm -hmm. that. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to do custom stuff, though, because the whole point of this car was to use factory parts and make it awesome. Yeah. So like a factory width 8.8 on the back of here, like off an Explorer, should add about three inches per side and uh, would be cool to run big box fenders on it. And the front end, if I was actually to use uh, Miata suspension, just install the subframe and everything and just have factory parts underneath the front end. Good suspension geometry, I mean, arguably could be the best from the factory. Right, yeah. And um, and then that would get the width on the front I would want, and uh, it would be pretty awesome. Yeah, it would definitely take this, you know, all the way to the resto mod category, right? right. Like bring, put, putting in other factory parts from other cars in the future. And the 8.8 is you know, so easily maintainable, so cheap, you know, to swap out, you know, uh, gearing and everything else. Differential parts. You can get a yeah. really good LSD. I won't have to weld it. I could actually right. just buy a part. Yeah. A legitimate <laughs> LSD for it. Yeah. That'd be crazy. That'd yep. be a first. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. But cool, customizable, 
um, you know, keeping cool old ro- cars on the road, something that R and D does. Mm. Um, and they also do sales. They do rentals. Uh, they were kind enough to let me have the super huge, awesome sticker. Um, I rented a 69 Mach one Mustang for my dad's birthday yeah. and, uh, we drove it very yeah. nicely yeah. all over the right, city. Yeah. And it was fantastic fun. Yeah. Um, they've got a lot of cool cars. They love the British cars as well. And um, they're going to be doing some hot rotting, uh, repowering type things as well at R&D. So um, look for them. They're on the face balls. They're on the interwebs. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, check the, them out. It's actually R&D, KC. looks like you lost an R. There. Oh, I did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dang uh, it. But it's R&D, KC. And they, like he said, they, they rent custom cars and they have uh, – storage for cars they have they're going to start doing some uh restoration work and other things so like they're they're in it if you have an old classic car you're in the kansas city area or if you just love classic cars and you want to drive around check them out because they're awesome and they helped out you know with the build out of the mgb gts (laughs) 60 percent of the time it works every time and the rest as they say is history Well, it's actually still being written. With the 2024 Rallycross season on the way and likely many, many more good seasons in the future, the MGB GTS is going to keep very busy. Ryan will too, always scheming, engineering, improving. We'll keep up with the build as it involves, but for now, since this video has been pretty lacking in the action department, Many thanks, as always, to Bob Heinsohn Racing, Kansas City's premier Volkswagen, Audi, Mercedes, BMW, German car experts. Can you still see out the front? 